Well, my name is Larry Naylor, and um, uh, I thought I'd just, before I start, just give you a, a little bit of an introduction. I met this person. Um, my background, uh, just a real quick background. Uh, I have a, a master's degree in uh, physical anthropology. I, um, I spent many summers uh, as a student at Geneseo working on the Macaulay site. I um, worked with Justin Tuliolo at Mills Mansion site in Mount Morris for the last uh, five or six, seven years. Um, in, in terms of photography, I've always had a, a great interest in photography. Um, I took a lot of photo classes when I was in college. I, um, I ended up in the early 80s becoming manager of a camera store, a Carhartt camera store in Southtown Plaza. While I was there, I, uh, I met a uh, medical photographer from the University of Rochester who taught me a lot of basics about uh, macro, macro, micro photography, excuse me. Um, I, I do enjoy photography. Um, I'm always trying to learn new things. And I hope this presentation, you take this presentation as a work in progress because um, I'm still learning things. I learned something new this morning, for, in fact. Um, I, um, the artifacts that I was lent came to me, most of them came to me from Justin Tuviolo from the Mills Mansion site. So I'm using those for examples on how to photograph small uh, artifactual art objects. So with that, let's get started. Let's see if I can advance this. Okay. Here we go. Um, these are some early macro photography shots I took in the early 80s, trying to learn how to do macro photography. Um, I had a lot of fun doing those. Uh, it's another one here. Um, just to give you a sense, I've always had a big fascination of, about macro photography, and uh, I've kind of pursued it in all these years since. Um, currently, I'm going to do more astrophotography. I was very lucky in May of 2022 to be able to spend four hours in the middle of the night uh, photographing a lunar eclipse. This is a composite of about 32 shots. Uh, currently, obviously, there's a solar eclipse coming in April. I bought a solar um, filter recently, and I've been learning to do solar photography. This is one of my better shots. I've been studying this sunspot. It takes about two weeks for it to go almost all the way across the sun. The topics I'm going to cover in the presentation, I'm just going to give you a little brief uh chat about photo basics, because I think that's important for the type of photography I'm doing. Um, talk very briefly about types of cameras, um, file formats. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about lighting, because uh, lighting is, is so important for photographing small archaeological objects. Um, very brief um, chat about backgrounds. Um, talk to you about the importance of scale. I don't think that, I think that's something that I think everybody understands, but we'll just mention it again. Um, I do want to mention there was a PDF, uh, and, and I have that in my references if anybody is interested in looking at some of these references afterwards. Uh, but one reference, um, <clears throat> scholar was talking about the difference between image management versus manipulation. Uh, and I was, I, I took that to heart. Um, and I think it's very important for us always to remember when we're photographing, especially archaeological objects, that we're, you know, when we take the pictures and we have to, you know, maybe up the contrast or up the brightness a little bit, that we're doing image management. We're not doing any manipulation of the, of the artifact itself. Um, there are protocols against that in publications, and uh, I want to show you that 
all the pictures that I took. Um, I did do some image management, uh, correcting for a little bit of light and shadow and uh, contrast and maybe sharpness, but uh, never any manipulation. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some examples um, that were kindly lent to me by, by Justin uh, from the Mills Mansion site, uh, ceramics and pottery and buttons, bone, coins, lithic, metal objects, and glass. Uh, I won't cover um, because it just, it's just too much to cover. Uh, focus stack, stacking. I don't know if anybody knows what focus stacking is, but it allows you to get better depth of field in a picture. Um, and it's basically you take pictures of an object at different focal ranges, and then you stack them together and software combines them all and you get a, a much better depth of focus. And we'll talk about that in a second, but I won't, I won't go into focus stacking. I won't go also into uh, photogrammetry. Uh, I'm intrigued by it and I, I know something about it. I've never tried it. I'm eager to try it. Um, and maybe in, in a future presentation, I can show you uh, what I've learned about photo, photogrammetry. And the other thing is I'm not gonna talk about specific Photoshop post-processing procedures because it would take hours to talk about that. And it's really not, not uh, the focus of my presentation. Um, before I get started, um, this was in the New York Times on the 15th. Um, there were some photographs, uh, macro photography, obviously, of uh, some cameos and intaglios, intaglios from ancient Rome. And um, I, I found the, I'm always looking at small art, artifact photography. Um, I'm always interested in how they did it. Um, one thing that is not notated in this and wasn't in the article pictured is a scale. Uh, but in the article, it mentioned that these artifacts are between one and two centimeters. So they're very, very small. And again, uh, it's the way they were photographed, the way they were lit that makes them very interesting to see. A um, little bit about photography in general. Um, photography consists of a, what we call an exposure triangle, and that consists of um, ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. All photographs um, depend on the exposure triangle to get a good image. ISO um, is defined as a film sensitivity. And of course, when we used to use film, you get film at different sensitivities and you'd use them depending on what kind of photography you're gonna be able to do. Now with digital cameras, that's just something you just dial in. Um, and the purpose of ISO is to, um, um, if, you, if you have bright light or dim light, um, you want to use a different ISO for for um, um, photographs you're going to take in in um, um, bright, very bright light. You'd want to use a low ISO. You'd use a high ISO if you're going to use uh, take pictures of, of something that's quite dark. Um, aperture is the circular hole for, through which light passes to the sensor. A small hole allows less light, producing a darker image, and a larger hole allows more light, producing uh, a brighter image. Um, aperture is very important for what we call depth of field. Um, depth of field is, is the amount of the photograph that's in sharp focus, okay? Um, apertures are expressed in f-stops. An f-stop of 5.6 is a large opening down here, and uh, an f-stop of, of 22 is a small opening. And that's important, especially for the photography that I'm going to be doing, showing you. Um, this is a little illustration. Um, <clears throat> at the same focal distance, if you use a large aperture or a low f-stop, you get a very shallow depth of field. If you use a smaller opening or a higher f-stop, you get a much larger depth of field. 
okay? Um, for any given distance from your subject that you're photographing, the closer you get to the subject, all things being equal, same ISO, same aperture, the closer you get to the object, the less depth of field you have. And that's gonna be important for macro photography because we're talking about distances of maybe a foot, foot and a half. And so your depth of field is very, very small. Shutter speed is um, considered a blinder in a camera, which covers the camera sensor. When you press the shutter button, the blinder opens up to allow light pass through it and hit the sensor. The longer the shutter is open, the brighter the image. Um, shutter speeds are me measured in fractions of a second. When you need more light, the shutter should be open longer. When you need less light, the shutter should be open less. Um, we're not worried about moving objects because uh, we're doing photography that's going to be on a tripod or a copy stand. Uh, there's three different file formats currently being used for the most part. The one that I think most people recognize is JPEG format. Um, that format's been used since probably the beginning of digital cameras. Um, it's what they call a compressed format, which means that the information of that image is compressed and you end up with a small file size. A TIFF image is what they call a lossless form of file compression. It stores more image information and therefore storing more information, the file size is a bit larger. Um, a raw file captures uncompressed data from a camera sensor and is sometimes referred to as a digital image or a di digital negative, excuse me. And that is a, a large file size. And it's kind of important to know when you have you know, storage for your, for your photos, um, a JPEG will probably be between 2.53 megabytes, maybe a little more than that. Whereas a raw format, um, the file size could be 25 megabytes, 30 megabytes, because it's uncompressed data, okay? And there's a lot of it, so your file size is large. So you need file storage that's you know quite a bit higher to be able to capture those. I shoot in raw because it gives me more information to work with when I'm doing post-processing. Um, this is my methodology for, for taking the photos, photos you're gonna see. Uh, I use a DSLR camera, which is a digital SLR camera. SLR means that you, you see right through the lens. I use a macro lens. Um, you can use extension tubes. I used to use extension tubes in the past. They're less expensive and they work quite well. Um, but I had an opportunity to buy a used macro lens. So I, I grabbed it because I do a lot of macro photography. Um, all the photos you're gonna see here are done on a copy stand. Um, they can be done on a tripod. Uh, I use raw format uh, because I'm using a DSLR. Uh, my photos, I take all my photos with manual focus so I get real sharp pictures and I use manual settings. So I have full control of what the exposure is gonna be. I use an ISO of 100 or 200 because I'm working with bright subjects. Uh, the lighting is such that it's quite bright and I can use an ISO that's very low. Um, my lens, uh, when I got my lens, uh, I had to test it out to see what would be the best aperture for uh, sharp pictures. Um, and through testing, I found out that an f-stop of 11 um, was, was best for sharpness of focus. Uh, sometimes I use an f-16 f-stop uh, if I'm trying to get a little more depth of field. Problem is when you get smaller um, f-stops, um, you get a, a physical property called dense diffract lens diffraction. Lens diffraction, uh, I won't explain it in detail, but the smaller the opening, smaller the aperture, the more the light coming through that aperture tends it tends to spread out. And 
as a result of that, you think you're getting better depth of field, but in fact, you're sacrificing the sharpness of the picture because the light is actually scattered. Um, so my variable when I take these pictures is my shutter speed. And because I've got the camera on a, on a copy stand, that's not a problem because I'm not moving it. So I can use a shutter speed of two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, or a half a second, or a hundredth of a second, it wouldn't make any difference. So that's my variable. Um, I use Photoshop and Camera Raw for post-processing. Post um, I found that it's best to use either black or white backgrounds, depending on the object that I'm, 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 I'm uh, taking a picture of. Uh, and I use a light table to eliminate shadows, and I'll show you that. That's something that I learned within the last couple of years, and it, it kind of revolutionized the way I take macro photography of, of small objects. And I bracket for best exposure. Bracketing means um, you'll, because I'm using my shutter speed as a variable, I'll take a picture at a shutter speed of um, maybe half a second, take a look at the image. If it looks too dark or too light, I'll take another picture either using a faster or slower shutter speed to vary the light coming in. And um, when I hit that sweet spot, uh, then that's what I want to use to do post-processing. Post, post Tongue twister. I also recommend uh, when you take pictures of small artifacts that if you're in post-processing, it's a good idea to uh, have a log um, of what vari variance that you do. In other words, when I post-process a picture, I may up the contrast a little. I may lower the shadows a little bit, just, just a tiny bit. The, the key is to try to get a photograph that is a good, the best exposure you can get before you post-process. Otherwise, you're fooling around with this stuff. And I don't think it's, it's very proper for the photo to be doing that kind of manipulation. Um, obviously, the first photograph you probably should take is in the field if you find an artifact that's of some importance or something that you want to make sure if something happens to the artifact that you've got a record of it. Um, I use my hand. It's a good scale. Take a picture of it. This was These are done with an iPhone. Camera types. Um, you can take photos of artifacts with just about any type, type of camera. The thing you need to remember is with a smartphone and a compact digital camera that you really don't have an awful lot of control over the shutter speed, the ISO, and the aperture. They're set for you automatically. So if you do want to do some manipulation, you really can't do it very well with those two types of cameras. With a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, um, you have full control. And that's why I use a digital camera. Uh, this is my camera. Uh, I use... I bought this in 2015 when my grandson was born and I've been using it ever since. I've taken probably hundreds of thousands of pictures with it. Uh, it's a, it's an, I, I've always used a Nikon, so uh, this is a Nikon camera. The nice thing about this camera is that um, it has a uh, flash, attached flash to it. Um, it's, it's a DSLR, so you're looking through a viewfinder, but mine also has the option to um, make it full frame mirrorless. So you're looking right into the monitor, looking at your image through the monitor and not through the viewfinder. Uh, the micro lens that I purchased, um, used is a Nikkor micro 105 millimeter micro lens. Um, for my setup, and my setup is a do yourself setup. This is a, this is a setup on a budget. And I thought I would start with that because anybody who is interested in taking some uh, photographs of small objects and they don't, if they don't have a real good budget, this is this, I'm your man because um, this is a this is all sort of put together um, as inexpensively as possible. I'll say it that way. I use gooseneck lamps that are clip on. You can clip them onto a table. You can clip them onto a bar. You can. You can clip them onto anything, uh, and you can whoops. You can uh, you can use 
them. You, the idea of the gooseneck is you can twist that light around and get angles that you wouldn't be able to get any other way. So I really like the goosenecks. Um, I use a light table. You'll see that I've used a light table for most of the photographs. Um, I bought a light table during the pandemic. Um, I was tracing patterns for woodworking projects and also doing storyboards for some <clears throat> stories that I used to make. I make little story booklets for my grandson and I would do tracing on that. And when I learned that the light table was great for eliminating shadows, I was all in. Um, I also use a piece of plexiglass that's about the size of the white space in this light table. Um, I put it on uh, uh, three quarter inch dowels and that's about two and a half inches. And then I put some felt pads on the bottom so that I can slide it along this uh, light table. And you'll see what it, you'll see in a couple of minutes how that goes. Uh, some accessories that I use. Uh, I use modeling clay, sometimes an artifact. You've got to lift it up a little bit, prop it up a little bit, tilt it a little ways. Uh, modeling clay is good. I learned through one article that I read to wrap it in saran wrap so that you're not, you know, sometimes modeling clay can stick to your artifact. Using saran wrap, it doesn't stick. And that's it's kind of nice because sometimes I use modeling clay on the plexiglass. And if I don't have saran wrap on it, when I take it off, I'm now going to wipe that spot off because it leaves a spot on the plexiglass. Erasers are good for elevation of the scale. Uh, I'll show you an example of that. Um, sticky wax or wax adhesive uh, is good. Uh, I One shot, I have some uh, medical ampules at the end of the presentation that don't sit on the plexiglass very well, they just roll. So just a tiny little bit of um, sticky wax will keep them steady so I can take the picture. I use clear um, scales, clear rulers. I got these, but Justin let me borrow one of them. And then I found, they're hard to find, but I found a company called Westcott that makes the same type of transparent scales. And that's what I use for all my scaling. Um, for a background, for a black background, I've been using this for about 30 years. This is a scrap of black velvet that I bought about 30 years ago. I use it for just about everything. It's like my security blanket. Um, and I use that because as a non-reflective surface, uh, it does collect a little bit of lint, that's the negative, but in terms of reflection, it hardly re reflects any light. It's great for that. Brushes I use because when I have something, an artifact, on the plexiglass, sometimes there's a bit of dust. Um, there could be a fragment of the artifact that fell onto the plexiglass. And um, uh, the brushes are great for kind of cleaning that up. Now in post-processing, you could clean up all the dust spots, but it just takes time. I use, um, for my lighting, I use compact fluorescent bulbs. Um, they're harder to get now because most bulbs now are are uh, LEDs. I buy these on Amazon. Um, since I grow hydroponic lettuce, um, I grow hydroponic lettuce with 6,400 Kelvin uh, compact fluorescent bulbs. Um, and I use the 100 watt equivalent because that's what I use for my hydroponics. So I, um, the nice thing about 6,400 Kelvin lights is that they're what they call daylights, uh, daylight lights, which means that they approximate, um, there's, there's no color tinting really to the 6400, anything from around 5,500, I'm sorry, uh, 5,000 to 6400 Kelvin lights are good for photographing objects. Um, some articles I've seen, they use uh, 5,000 um, K, uh, either LED or or um, compact fluorescent. I haven't used the LEDs just because the lighting is a little different. It's, it's something that I'm going to have to adapt to. Eventually, I'm, I'll probably switch to LEDs. Uh, diffusers are good to use. I have um, some, um, uh, some diffuser umbrellas, but they're a little cumbersome for small 
object photography that just take up too much space that kind of crowd you in. I found these on Amazon. They look like shower caps, but you, they just spread over my lamps and they, they do an adequate job. Um, most of the objects that you're going to see I've done with either a two light or a three light setup. And this is basically how it looks like. I have my camera on a, on a uh, copy sand. You could do it on a tripod, but it's a lot harder to do it to get straight down. And I have lights on either side. Could be two lights, could be three lights. At times I've shot with four lights. Um, the artifact is on plexiglass. And then you have the light table below. And this is what it looks like. This is, this is my rudimentary setup. I have two lights clamped. Uh, I have my camera on the copy stand. I have my view monitor, which kind of folds out so I can see my object because I'm going to set the camera in what they call a full frame mode, which means I'm looking through the monitor and not through the viewfinder. Um, and I've got my plexiglass and I've got my light table lit up below and I'm all set to go. Uh, here's another view of it. You can see the monitor, you can see the, the lights. Um, I usually start out with lights angling about 40 degree angle from the from the light table and the, and the plexiglass surface and go from there. There's a close up of the light table with the plexiglass on top of it. So let me just give you a, a quick light, lighting demonstration. I just wanna show you how, very, this is the important part of the presentation is what you do with the lighting. Um, and when you have the lighting on goosenecks, it's great because you can twist the lights around anywhere you want, up, down, angle them any way you want to get the type of view that you want, the type of lighting that you want um, to take picture of, of, of your object. This was a um, an artifact that came from Mill's mansion. A knife, you can see it's in very fragile condition, so I was very careful. I, I wanted to take different views of it, but couldn't because it was so fragile. So I first took a picture of the artifact with the lights at about a 45, four, between a 40 and 45 degree angle. Here's a view from the top. You can see I've got the knife set up on, and I have it set up on the plexiglass, and I have it on an angle because I want to use the macro lens, uh, and my copy stand is only so high, and I, I had it as high as I could possibly get, possibly get it, and so therefore I could not um, put it straight, so I had to put it on a diagonal. I set up my ruler, my scale, and I have it held with those two erasers. And again, depending on the height of the object, you may have to use three erasers, four erasers to get, get that height so that when you're focusing, you're going to have the scale and the object at the same, fo at same focusing distance. So in my monitor, before I took the picture, this is, what I, this is what it looks like. My monitor, thankfully, has an option where I can put graph on it. And with most pictures, I would have that graph, have the the scale lined up and the object lined up so that I can see exactly where it is so I don't have to manipulate it afterwards. I can make some adjustments afterwards in post-processing. I'd rather not do it because it's more time consuming. Here's a, the monitor after the picture was taken so I can take a look at the exposure. If the um, exposure is too dark, I would uh, um, make sure that I adjust the shutter speed if it's too light, again, adjust the shutter speed so I can get the right exposure. And this is the exposure with that lighting situation at about 40 to 45 degree angle. So then I took uh, a photo of the object, the knife at a 30 degree angle. So I lowered the lights, twisted them around a little bit and I got this. If you'll notice this picture, and I'll show a composite afterwards so you can see it, a um, little bit different than the first one. You can see with the lights are a little bit lower, you can see a little bit of the texture in the wood on the handle. This, this wood is deteriorated and it's very fragile, but you can see a little bit of depth in it now. Uh, here it is again at 20 degree angle, 
And again, you can see a little more depth And then I finally tried to take a photograph of it at a, about approximately a 10 degree angle. Got this. So looking at the four of them, this was at a 45 degree angle, a 30 degree angle, a 20 degree angle, and a 10 degree angle. And you notice there's some, some differences. And again, depending on what you want to present in your artifact, is dependent on how you position the lighting. Is there any rules to the lighting? No. Um, I think the more you take pictures of small artifacts and working with the lights, um, you get used to what you think might be a good lighting situation. Try that out. And depending on what you want for the final image is what you'll choose. I think of the four of these, personally, uh, this one's just a little bit too low and um, I'm, I'm not sure that would be my favorite. This would probably be my favorite here. This one here doesn't show, you really can't see the wood. Whereas here you can start seeing, here you can really see all the wood. So it depends on what you're looking for in your final image. So let's take a look at some ceramics and pottery. <clears throat> Again, I don't have too many examples, um, but of the ones that, um, I was loaned to by Justin. I, I thought I would take a few shots of a couple of these. Um, this is with the light table uh, and scale. Um, this is the same image in Photoshop. Very easily, you can adjust the picture and drop it to grayscale. So this is the same photograph, only in grayscale. Some publications or most publications probably need grayscale or, or black and white photos. Uh, but for presentations, you might you, whoops, you might want this one here. Um, then I I shot the same artifact in a black background, um, just to see what the difference would be. And here's a black and white version of that. So depending on what you want, what looks best, uh, I suggest you take you know if, if it's a it's an important artifact. You might want to take it at, at a variety of uh, background situations to see what you like best, what presents it best. Um, this is a picture. This was not taken with a macro lens. It was taken with my 50 millimeter lens because um, I put all, what was it, one, two, it was nine pieces, put them all in the plexiglass with the scale. And my macro lens can't take a picture from uh, my my copy stand won't allow me to take a picture with the macro lens, so I took it with a 50 millimeter lens. Um, this is a potsherd that I uh, that came from Mills Mansion. Uh, this is the outside, the inside, and this is trying to demonstrate the curvature and the thickness of the potter. Buttons. Um, unfortunately, the buttons that I received from Justin were in mounts. Uh, luckily, they're transparent, so I just shot through them. And so I I shot each one of these separately, and then I shot my scale separately because I couldn't really do it any other way. And here's a composite of those three buttons. I think this one is a, see, so Justin told me what this one was. Case you're I mean, this is milk glass, mother of pearl in the middle, and this is probably black glass. Um, not quite sure. Um, <clears throat> some examples of bone. Uh, when I was a grad student at the University of Toronto, I took a faunal osteology course and um, was interested enough to start my own collection of, of, of faunal material. And um, so this, I've always wanted to um, take several, or sort of, sort of do a handbook of photographs of, of uh, faunal specimens uh, as a guide for faunal identification. This was taken uh, at an F-16 because I wanted a little more depth of field. 
And I really, with this, I really wanted to get the shadows. You can see the contours of the, of the skeletal material. Um, here's a, a radius from my collection. And as I was going through the, some of the uh, funnel material that Justin loaned to me, I found this radius of uh, gray squirrel in the collection. And as I was taking, as I was processing the photo, I noticed this little spot here. So I went back and took a close up of it. And sure enough, those are cut marks, which um, at a low angle, light at low angle, they really show up quite well. Uh, two more butchered bones from Mills Mansion. The idea here was to try to take pictures so that you could see the cut marks more clearly. And here, obviously, the saw marks. Uh, this bone was interesting because of all of the uh, rodent gnawing on it and uh, shows up quite clearly. I want to take some pictures of coins, and I did a lot of research on that. I, I tried my own experiments with just using two light system and found that they really weren't adequate for taking coins. Um, a lot of professional coin photographers use what they call an axial lighting, city, axial lighting system, if I can say it, um, which I didn't know anything about. So uh, this is one thing I learned through... Um, research doing this presentation. It's called axial lighting. The light comes from the side and it hits a glass plate, which is at a 45 degree angle. The light is reflected directly onto the object, in this case, coin, which is, you'll notice is right in the view of the camera. And obviously there is some excess light that passes through the glass. Um, I don't have to worry about it because I've been doing this in the basement, and so it just goes out into the basement. Um, but if you were in a small area, this light here, if it was on a reflective surface, could bounce back and um, affect your image. Um, I did this on the cheap. I found uh, a work light from Harbor Freight. I'm not giving a commercial for Harbor Freight, but. This was a cheap work light, uh, a 1250 lumen work light, and I adapted it. I tried different things. I tried doing uh, um, a square tube, a round tube. Uh, I tried lots of different things and found out that a large yogurt container worked best. Um, I spray painted it black, but still when I turned on the light, light was leaking out through the uh, yogurt container, so I wrapped it in duct in duct tape. So it doesn't look very pretty, but it works. This is the view of it looking down through the container. LED, this is an LED light. LED lights are a little different than other lighting. Um, and so this lighting was meant to scatter light. Well, I don't want scattered light when I'm trying to focus it into a glass plate. Um, so this seemed to work quite well. Uh, I made a, a frame for it, 45 degree angle. And I have a nail here so that the piece of glass just rests on that. I bought the glass uh, by purchasing a couple of eight by 10 frames from the dollar store. And uh, the frames fell apart before I even got home. Uh, but I wasn't worried about the frames. I wanted the glass, and it works quite well. Uh, this is a view of the uh, axial lighting from the light source. You can see the piece of glass sitting here at a 45 degree angle. And here's a view looking at the axial lighting, plexiglass, or I mean the uh, plate of glass. I have here uh, sort of a, a baffle. I made it out of black uh, foam board um, so that this light, you can see how this light is hitting this. That's so that it will block the light um, hitting the artifact inside so that the light is only coming from this reflected surface. 
and here's a view from the top. So you can see lights coming from here and it's being reflected off the glass and onto the object. And here are some photographs. These are coins that uh, I inherited coin collection from my dad. And uh, I wanted to get some older coins, get some coins that were kind of beat up um, that might simulate coins you might find at an archeological site. This is a, a dollar, silver dollar from 1881. Um, this was actually the first artifact I think I ever found. Um, I was a kid and I was about 11 years old and in a plowed field near my house, I found uh, this Canadian penny, 1886. I was so excited, I went home and I scrubbed it to death. I realize now I shouldn't have done that, but at the time I was just more excited to find this old coin. Um, then you'd have penny from 1860. These are composite pictures. I took coin, took one picture, flipped it over, took another picture, uh, and then through Photoshop, I combined them. Um, interesting thing about this nickel is the scratches, kind of an odd pattern. A dime, pretty beat up dime from 1902. A quarter from 1908, hardly recognizable. And a nice half dollar from 1942. And then with Photoshop, I can just do a composite. So I thought I'd put them all together. I didn't scale most of these because I figure everybody knows what a dime, side of a dime, a nickel, and a penny. Uh, but I thought I'd fool around with the scale for this composite. Um, axial lighting is also good for looking into things. And Ed, that's what I was telling you about. Um, I took, I tried to find some objects that were, you know, that I could look inside of. I didn't have too many objects. This one is, uh, an attachment to my uh, walking pole that I use when I snowshoe. Um, and looking inside, you can see this metal. Looks like a metal washer at the bottom of it. Um, this is actually a cologne cap. It's about three centimeters deep. And you can see down at the bottom, there's a pattern, um, which I wouldn't be able to get under any other lighting condition. This, this here, um, kind of bugged me for a while. I kept turning it around and this didn't disappear. It's not an artifact of the lighting. I think it's the chemical of the cologne that's on the side of the cap. So it gives this interesting pattern, but um, I was more interested in this right here. Uh, this is a, a marker cap. And again, about three, almost three and a half centimeters. You can clearly see the bottom of that cap. And finally, um, a blue Sharpie large marker that's about five centimeters deep. And again, uh, if you focus at the bottom, you can see it says five, maybe five H, but you can actually see the bottom of it. Uh, so axial lighting, if you have, uh, have ar archaeological artifacts that are, have some depth to them and you want to look inside of them, uh, you might want to think about setting up an axial lighting situation. Uh, lithics, um, this, these are, I was loaned um, a lot of Lamoka points from Dick Bark. I was interested, and I still am, if I ever get to it, interested in um, um, doing a study on Lamoka points and variation amongst Lamoka points. Uh, so I took three pictures and made a composite. Um, this was supposed to be an orthographic photo, composite photo. Um, Justin, I showed this to Justin, he said, yes, yeah, great, but actually, uh, technically, this should be in the middle. And I was going to make that change. This is the one slide that I wish I had done over again. Um, it's easy to do in Photoshop, just switch it. Um, but this is a composite, both sides and on, on end. Uh, this one, I just took eight points and just set them on the plexiglass. I used my 50 millimeter lens. And uh, the one thing I, I think doing each point individually and, and doing a composite is a little better because you can control the lighting. You can see the lighting is a little different 
depending on the point. It's really hard to do several objects, especially the lithic objects, and try to get um, the lighting the same on all of them. I tried as I might, I really couldn't do it, but um, it's not bad, but I, I think a composite would probably be a little bit better. Um, this is a broken blade, um, which I think has had a little bit of retouching or reworking right here. Uh, I thought I would try a hammer stone. This is actually a hammer stone, probably an anvil stone, and possibly a, um, an abrading stone. And I took four views of it and then did a composite. Um, I did, this is one of the first small artifact photos I did a couple of years ago, um, working on debutage analysis and thought I would start out by um, demonstrating the uh, anatomy of a flake. Some metal objects from Mills Mansion, uh, several different views, just experimenting. Uh, this is a not a composite. Again, I put these all in the plexiglass, shot them with a 50, 50 millimeter lens um, just to see what would happen. This was a gear that was found at Mills Mansion. I don't know what gear belongs to. Um, it's kind of an interesting little gear. It's got this wound up wire, it might be a spring. Um, and again, I, I, it was suggested to me that I try to do a composite. This is, is this is a composite photograph uh, or a composite image, I should say, um, but make it so that um, it has a little bit of graphics to it. So uh, I, I don't really do a lot of graphics, so I'm still learning how to do that. Um, this was my first try at that, but it gives you some annotation which if you were interested in this gear and uh, want to learn more about it, at least you have some dimensions. Uh, finally, in metal objects, this is a pin from Mills Mansion. Um, and uh, through this, I learned how to do um, this magnified view. It's called insert. Uh, this can be done fairly easily in Photoshop. Last but not least, I did some glass. I don't have too many, I didn't have too many glass objects, unfortunately. Um, so I worked with the few objects that I had. I want to do more glass. I'm learning more about how to photograph glass. Glass is probably the most difficult. That's why I saved it to last to photograph because it's such a reflective surface. So uh, I did some experimentation. All my lights had diffusers on them uh, to try to soften the light a little bit. And I spent a lot of time working the lights to try to keep the reflection down. Whoops. Um, so I took one on, on a white background and then I took uh, a bunch, I put a bunch together. Um, these are medical annuals, ampules, excuse me, um, that were made around 1850. And you can see they were single use uh, medical ampules. And you see the little thin spot here, it would snap them and then the medicine inside would be used, be a one use. And what I liked about using a back background is that you can actually see the inside of the glass here, near the top. The last object that I did was um, a glass stain, stand of some sort. Um, this was a, really a challenge. And I've, I've kind of learned something from this, I think, uh, probably in the future, I would maybe um, use a different brightness of light. Um, uh, I might use a polarizer to see if I could take some of the glare down. Um, but this was sort of my first attempt at this. Um, it's a difficult piece to photograph, I learned. Um, and as you can see, the lighting for that uh, is not directly on, on the object. The, the lights are tilted away, and that's all the light I, 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 I needed. I didn't need anything else. 
In fact, um, in some respects, it's probably too much light even then. And that's it. Um, I appreciate everybody who attended. And if you have questions or comments, or if you have suggestions for me to improve my techniques, I appreciate it. Hey, Larry, it's Greg. Can you hear me? Yes. So what do you think you have invested in your light stands? Not that, not with the, uh, uh, with your uh, tripod or your uh, test stand, but just the materials, glass, reflective stuff, just round number. I would definitely be under $100, maybe $75. I mean, collective glass is pretty inexpensive. Um, I have a table saw, so I can get a, a larger piece of plexiglass for eight, ten dollars and cut it into various sizes. Uh, the lamps are between fifteen and twenty dollars a piece. Um the the bulbs, I can get four bulbs now, I think, on Amazon for about twelve dollars. Um the clay, about six dollars. Um what am I missing? Oh, the light stand, the 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 um uh, um the light um that um i think i paid more than 20 dollars for that and on amazon i bought the least expensive i didn't know i was going to use it for artifacts i think i might want to um get one a little bit more expensive you know get a larger one uh but very inexpensive i go to well i paid 27 dollars for the Harbor Freight light. Uh, and that was perfectly ad adequate for what I wanted to do. And how about the camera stand itself? Um, I don't know. I, I was loaned that from Justin. I don't know how expensive those are. I think I have seen designs on the internet to build your own. I don't know how, how easy they are to build and they don't look too complicated. And I don't know what the cost would be in materials, but not, not a lot. Does yours have a gear system where you can rotate it up and down? No, I wish it did. <clears throat> um, mine, it, it um, you loosen it and then you have to move it by hand. Yeah, yeah, okay. and it's a little bit cumbersome. It's an old copy stand, um, but you know, and the camera is kind of heavy, so you got to be careful when you do it and just kind of push it up a little bit. But it works, works all right. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. But the, but the idea is. You know, there's there's no set way of of taking photographs of small objects. I mean, there's there's a lot out there, and if you're interested, I have a a, a whole bunch of references that you can take a look at, uh, and probably from them you can probably find a lot more. Um, but in terms of the lighting um, and how you set the lighting and you know your setup, there's there's a hundred ways of doing it at least. But what I like about it, and the thing that I really liked about this lighting system is using the light table, it eliminates shadows. And I think in in doing small object photography, the thing that always drove me crazy is you always had that shadow to deal with. You know, if you put it on a piece of paper or whatever background you put it on, uh, and you take a picture, you, you can't eliminate that shadow. With a light table up just just above a, a light table, you eliminate that shadow completely. And that's what I like. Mm. Larry, it's Sissy. I, first of all, I'm, I just want to say thank you so much. This was so informative. Good. And, and now I'm extremely embarrassed <laughs> by everything that I've sent in for the articles that I've published. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled, but I, I do a lot of photography, small objects photography, just not not to have anybody go, wow, look at that photo, but just it's part of my analysis. I sure. I photograph just about everything. And one of the things that is always difficult to, to manage is that I don't have a light box and I do have a lot of trouble with the shadows. So you're mm -hmm. gonna laugh, but what I do is I take a thick piece of paper and I cover the light source with it Okay. And a lot of times it makes the shadow um, disappear. That, right, because it that it's it's acting as a diffuser and it's softening the light, and that will that will invariably soften the sh any shadowing you have. It will yeah. 
Yeah, it, it won't eliminate it, but it will certainly help. And I, I've tried, especially, I've been trying to take pictures of shiny pennies because they're highly reflective when I'm using axial lighting. And I've tried tracing paper, I've tried um, copy paper, I've tried all sorts of things to try to, to re reduce the, you know, the light coming through or reducing some of that reflection. Uh, and that's difficult too, but yeah, any, I mean, I've seen articles where people use ping pong balls on small LED lights and cover them with ping pong balls for diffusion. I mean, there's, there's as inventive as, as you can be, um, might be helpful, certainly. I have a question for you about yeah. some of the objects that we found from the tram site. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're supposed to um, give them to the RMSC. And, you know, now I'm thinking, you know, there were some very nice artifacts that came off the tram site. And would you be willing to photograph them? Sure. Sure. I'd, I'd enjoy the challenge. It, is Doug Pippin on this uh, Zoom? Steve. Doug, are you yeah. there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, you know, uh, I, do we have a complete inventory of the tram stuff? Because I'm wondering if, if it might be possible for you to pull the more interesting things like the pot and um, the, the bone awl, and then there were some beads. All of those types of things, all those diagnostic things, uh, would be great if they could, if you could photograph them, Larry. And, and great uh, presentation, really. This is a, sure. um, a very informative, very well done. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. It was a, excellent. Yeah. All right. So, Doug, we'll ha we'll have to get together and have a chat about that. Okay. Yeah, for sure. All right. Any other questions for yeah. Larry? Comments? We just thought. Well, Larry, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're very yeah. welcome. It was Good my job. pleasure. I, uh, it, was, it was sort of, uh, I said I would do photographing small objects. I knew I could do it, but as I got more and more, because I haven't done an awful lot of that, um, that specifically, photographing artifacts. And as I started going through research, um, I kept saying, oh, I didn't know this. I didn't know that. So I learned an awful lot by preparing this presentation. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've well, loved you, it. You yeah. put a lot into it, Larry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Well Alrighty. done. Thanks, Larry. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good, good night. night.